In the West, it's easy to see the big picture. The landscapes are dominated by sky, land, and water. These are the images that we value for our lifestyle and our living. It's easy to miss the small things that could drastically change these vistas. Small things like an insect. Western forests have seen a rogues gallery of insect pests that have caused major damage as a result of their feeding. Members of the infamous group include the Western spruce budworm, Douglas fir tussock moth, and the notorious mountain pine beetle and a relative newcomer, the gypsy moth, is trying to make this list. As its name implies, the gypsy moth is a vagabond. When moved by an unsuspecting homeowner or tourist, the vagabond is then free to exploit its new home. By this method of spread, the moth has either colonized or spot infested the eastern U.S., portions of the South and Midwest, and now is poised to expand its range to the western United States and Canada. Why should forest managers and the public in the West be concerned about this unwelcome visitor? basically because it has the potential to cause serious economic, ecologic, and social impacts to areas where it may become established. In some areas where the gypsy moth has established itself, federal and state quarantines have been imposed. Essentially, quarantines are designed to prevent the introduction and spread of pest species, such as the gypsy moth, into areas where they have not previously been found. Forest products such as raw logs, lumber, Christmas trees, or nursery stock may be included in quarantines along with other outdoor household articles. During severe infestations, complete defoliation of host trees can be expected. However, unlike the deciduous trees of the eastern U.S., which can tolerate multiple defoliations, many western conifers cannot. Once completely stripped of their needles, death is predictable. And if defoliated trees are not killed outright, they can become more susceptible to attack by secondary insects and pathogens. Once the gypsy moth becomes established, it spreads rapidly into the surrounding trees, aided by its huge reproductive potential. A single egg mass may contain as many as 1,000 individuals. The loss of trees and other vegetation has a ripple effect through the environment. Watersheds can become degraded, losing their potential to store and release needed water. With severe defoliation, streamside zones, called riparian, can be adversely affected. Stream temperatures could increase, and nutrient cycles may be disrupted. These, in turn, could have significant impacts on fish and other aquatic life. During large outbreaks, the migrating caterpillars often swarm trees, buildings, sidewalks, and even people who happen to be in their path. Needless to say, the caterpillars create a significant nuisance by their presence, but also by the large amounts of droppings called frass deposited as they feed. Although we've experienced several spot infestations in the West, there is a more dramatic experience occurring in the East Midwest, and portions of the South. An estimated 7 million acres were infested by the gypsy moth in 1990. And although certainly high, this number is still under that which was experienced in 1981 when over 12 million acres were defoliated. Forest pest specialists estimate that over 1.5 million acres were treated with pesticides to reduce tree defoliation and nuisance larvae in 1990. 
How did we get to this point? And what do we do now? History can give us some clues. It all began in 1869 at this house on number 27 Myrtle Street, Medford, Massachusetts. This was the home of Etienne Leopold Trouvelot, entrepreneur and naturalist who imported gypsy moths from Europe, intending to cross them with silkworms. The ultimate intent being to produce a prolific silk moth. However, the experiment was a failure, and the unattended moths soon escaped, apparently never to be seen again. Except by the scientists' neighbors, who soon found themselves besieged. As impacts from the gypsy moth increased in size and severity, the Massachusetts State Legislature in 1889 formed a task force to deal with the problem. Using European techniques and new solutions of their own, crews combed infested woods, removing egg masses by hand, tore up walks and fences, cut and burned infested woods. Other eradication efforts included using fire to remove gypsy moth from rocks and other hard places to reach, applying creosote oil to egg masses, and eventually using the new pesticides of the day, Paris green and lead arsenate. By 1900, the large outbreaks had subsided, and the Massachusetts legislature stopped eradication efforts. However, by 1912, the moth had expanded its range to include four neighboring states. The federal government got involved in 1906 and has been ever since. Nevertheless, the pest spread from state to state over the next hundred years. The moth became an overwhelming burden with managers increasingly happy just to hold the line. By the early 1960s, the eastern states gave up trying to eradicate the moth. The blight had just gotten too extensive and expensive to control. The West has already had numerous introductions. In most cases, these have resulted from gypsy moth hitching a ride on outdoor household articles and then transported by families moving west from the infested areas of the East. Lab studies conducted by Oregon State University indicated that the caterpillar can survive on many economically important western conifers. But no one knows for sure how gypsy moth will adapt to the conifer and streamside habitats of western Montana and northern Idaho. This much is certain. Should the gypsy moth establish itself in these ecosystems, the impacts could be ominous. Many factors combine to make the gypsy moth such a potent pest, a huge reproductive potential, few natural enemies, and mostly because they just eat, eat, and eat, with the potential to survive on more than 500 different species of plants. Hatching of young caterpillars or larvae is staggered, making the timing of control efforts difficult. Moreover, newly hatched caterpillars may disperse by action of the wind and can travel upwards of 12 miles or more. Mountainous western terrain may aid their spread as they move from ridgetop to ridgetop. The caterpillars feed from late April to early July in the west, depending on temperatures, and can grow to almost two inches in length. A single caterpillar may consume upwards of one square foot of foliage during its development. Once feeding is completed, the caterpillars are ready to pupate. During this time, the caterpillars will again disperse. After they pupate, which usually lasts from 10 to 14 days, the mature moths emerge and mate. This can occur any time from mid-June to mid-September in the West. And although the female has wings, she does not fly to find her mate. Instead, she emits a powerful sex attractant, or pheromone, that lures the male to mate. After mating, the female then lays a single, fluffy, buff-colored egg mass, which can contain from 50 to 1,000 individuals. 
weapons to launch a renewed attack next spring. State and federal agencies stand together on the defense. Close cooperation is needed to treat infestations and to design the treatment strategy. The planning involves the public, who play a significant role in deciding how to manage the moth. Because like the problem, the treatment can be too close for comfort. Insect control programs frequently have incited public controversy such as with DDT spraying in the 1950s, which helped propel the green movement. Now the public contributes in choosing alternatives that everyone can live with. State and federal agencies agree that most important to any treatment plan is finding the mix toughest on the moth and softest on the environment, a policy called integrated pest management. The ideal treatment would target the gypsy moth alone. Several biologicals come close. Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt, is a common soil bacterium that is ingested by the feeding caterpillars, paralyzing their stomach wall, inhibiting feeding, and soon causing death. But also death to some Lepidoptera caterpillars, which may be feeding when Bt is applied. Special emphasis on involving the environmental community to reduce the impacts on non-target moths and butterflies has met with substantial success in Utah, where treatments with BT are ongoing. Nucleopolyhedrosis virus, or NPV, is a natural pathogen specific to the gypsy moth. The larvae ingest it as they chew themselves out of egg clusters or while eating leaves. NPV would seem to be the perfect biological, but it is hard to raise and to store, and as a result, has only been used on a limited basis. The moth's behavior can be manipulated. Traps baited with the female's sex attractant can be effective in capturing the males before they mate with the wild female. However, infestations must be detected in the very early stages for this method of control to have any chance of being successful. This technique is currently being evaluated for its effectiveness in trapping out small or isolated populations of the moth. In other field trials, egg masses containing both male and female larvae are sterilized by radiation. These are then reared to the adult stage and released into an infested area at the time of breeding. This technique can result in a significant number of unproductive matings. But like the pheromone disruption technique, it is only successful when populations are detected in very low numbers. There's also the tried and true mechanical methods of gypsy moth control generally not feasible on a large scale and only effective on a limited basis these methods offer the homeowner alternatives to chemical controls as caterpillars migrate down the tree during the day to seek shelter they often will congregate under simple burlap bands placed on susceptible trees by the homeowner the hiding caterpillars can then be gathered and destroyed a search and destroy mission for egg masses is one of the most painstaking, but also can be effective in limiting the impacts of invading moths on homeowner trees. In 1892, clearing the Dexter family elm of egg masses involved a week of painstaking work by several men. Effective, if labor intensive. During the past decade, natural enemies have played and will continue to play an increasing role in combating pest species. Gypsy moth is no exception. Parasites and predators alone cannot stop an outbreak, but they can help lengthen the time between outbreaks, thus giving trees previously defoliated time to recover. Chemical pesticides are also viable options, but these are often criticized for their impacts on non-target organisms. 
However, the insect growth regulator, Dimelin, has started to gain public acceptance in the eastern U.S. because of its effectiveness in reducing moth outbreaks. Severe cold can be deadening on gypsy moths, but temperatures must fall below minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit for five hours to have an effect on exposed, overwintering egg masses. Egg masses under the insulating cover of snow or litter layer are often less susceptible to the effects of cold winter temperatures. Still, the moth has the ability to adapt and even thrive in the temperate climates associated with the western United States. Already, the moth has spot-infested six western states. And many of these states have, or are now attempting, to eradicate the moth where it has gained a foothold. Early detection, a tool not available to last century's forest managers, gives managers of western forests an edge in responding to the moth before it can repeat the experiences of the past. Today, all western states use pheromone-baited traps to detect gypsy moth populations. Early detection reaps other benefits, including treating smaller, more manageable infestations increasing the probability of successful eradication programs, buying time to develop new technologies, avoiding large-scale, controversial, and costly suppression programs, and finding the mix of treatments toughest on the moth and softest on the environment. We know that managing the gypsy moth will always be a dynamic process. From the moth's history in the eastern U.S., we know what we could lose. We can deter the moth spread in the West by encouraging public awareness and early detection. By working together, we can retain the landscapes and resources we value for our lifestyle and our living. on gypsy moth, contact your state or federal forestry or agricultural agencies. <laughs>